God, that is who you are. Oh, you yeah. are we make a miracle, miracle worker. worker. Promise keeper, yeah. light in the darkness. Hallelujah. My God, that, that is, is who, who you are. are. Thank you, Jesus. You are, we make a miracle work. Promise keeper, light in the darkness. Oh, yeah, My God. God, that, that is, is who you are. Yeah. You are, we make a miracle work. Promise keeper, Thank you, light Jesus. in the darkness. Yeah. My God, that, that is who you are. Oh, yeah. You are we make a miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are we make yeah. a miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My, My God, God, that's that who is you are. Who Hallelujah. Can you just hold those words in your spirit as we approach the Word of God together? Father, we thank you that you are indeed what we have been singing about this morning. That Jesus is indeed the way maker. He's still a miracle worker. He's still capable of doing all that we need to be done. And we declare it out of our hearts this morning. In the sovereign name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, team. I want you just to hold those words because that, that's, that's where it needs to be. That's exactly, I, I felt not just what are the things that I've got to say this morning, but I, re, I really felt there was almost like Elijah said to the children of Israel, how long do you halt between two opinions? If God is God, then follow him. And I think sometimes the weight of our circumstance becomes greater than the weight of our belief. And I really feel that God has got something to say to us this morning that we can't, we can't afford to vacillate. We can't afford to be in two minds. We can't afford to have a thought that is not of faith and is not of him. Now, I, I don't consider myself a great person of faith. I struggle with faith like probably many of you do, but I just... I am so stirred in my spirit that God is wanting to say to us this morning about our faith and that we allow things to become bigger than God is. And, and we don't intend to do that. We don't deliberately do that. We're not where Israel was at that time, but sometimes it all just gets on top of us. And we find ourselves vacillating between two opinions. So I want to introduce you to the two most powerful words that you can ever have in your vocabulary. The two most powerful words. And the idea behind all of this is that as Paul the Apostle challenges us and challenges Timothy, He's challenging us to prophesy our future. You don't need a lecture. You don't need a sermon on words. You understand them. You know what you say. Thank you. You know what you say and what you do. You know how difficult it is to keep a hold on. Uh, you know, James does a whole chapter on the tongue and all the things we get ourselves into strife over because we say the wrong thing at the right time or the right thing at the wrong time or whatever, I don't know. But, but there is something about taking control of what we say. 
And so I want to introduce these words to you this morning. And the idea from Paul is that we should prophesy our future. We should declare health where there is sickness. We should declare blessing where there is lack. We should declare provision where there doesn't seem to be any. We should be declarers. And I know, I know that there will be people that come to you and tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, you're just making all of that up. You're just trying to do what you can't do and, and all of that. And they will come and they will bring doubts and they will sow seeds of negativity into your spirit. But these words are the most powerful words that you and I can lay hold of today. And that song, that song epitomizes where we have got to come to. So now having wet your appetite enough, I want you to come to Mark, to Mark chapter 9 from verse 21. The disciples had been out and about and Jesus was doing something else and busy and somebody brought a child to them who was obviously demon-possessed and uh, it used to seize him and throw him on the ground and in the fire and very unpleasant time. And they tried to fix the problem, but they couldn't. So Jesus appears in verse 20 of 9. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, faming at the mouth. I, I think it's always interesting without getting too distracted. And that's one of my main difficulties often as I get distracted. And, and he, Jesus said to the father, there's all this going on with the child. And Jesus says to the father, how long has this been happening? I, I just want you to get, and I want me to get, a picture of how in charge of every situation is Jesus. He doesn't stress. He doesn't press the panic button. He doesn't get overwhelmed. The child is doing all of this. And Jesus just quietly says to the father, how long has this been going on? And he said, from childhood. It's thrown him into the fire. It's tried to destroy him in water. But Jesus, if you can do anything, will you have compassion on us and help us? And Jesus says these words, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I want to introduce you to the two most powerful words in this book. And the two most powerful words in your life are I believe. I really believe in this hour that God is wanting to introduce to us afresh the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of the truth of Jesus Christ and who he is. We're living in an era that we haven't been for a long, long time. And it's getting worse. Hallelujah. In which there is a concerted effort to attack spiritual stuff. There is a concerted effort to make the church look weak. And those of us who gather on Sunday as if we've come here because we are, are less than. And we need to begin to rehearse in the midst of our situation these words. I believe. I heard someone say the other day that if your prayers are not being answered and what you're asking for is not working out, then bring it to Jesus. Have a dialogue with the King because it's not His fault. There's something we haven't touched. There's something we haven't broken through into and we need to talk to Jesus. And they brought this boy who they'd taken to the disciples. They then bring him to Jesus. 
And, and, and folks, we've got to learn to do that. We've got to destroy any pride we might have or any element of, of, well, I'm bigger than the problem that we might have and humble ourselves and say, Jesus, this isn't working and it can't be you because you're the king of glory. So it's got to be something that I'm not, I'm not looking for guilt here. I'm not looking for negativity. I'm looking for dialogue with the king. And I want to say, Jesus, why haven't I got a hold on this? Why aren't I seeing what you say I can do? And, and we need to keep reciting these words, I believe. And I'm going to give you three scriptures before we finish this morning that I want you to really lay hold of because prophetically I want to paint a picture for you and for me just how big God is. Come with me to Matthew 28. We've heard these verses, I think, a few weeks ago, but listen to this. Verse 18, Jesus' last words to the disciples before he goes back to glory. So these have got to be important, eh? Hallelujah. This has got to be important. If this is the last thing that someone is able to say to you, you'd want to think that's got to be important. If they're leaving for overseas or going somewhere else and you're not going to see them again and they say, look, I want to say this to you, you'd be hanging off those words because they are very important. They're the last words. And I think we skip over some of this stuff and I'm more guilty than you are, but we just phase over it without getting it into our spirits. So Jesus came and he spoke to them, verse 19, 18. And he said this, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is with us every day of every day. And what kind of God is he? You know, <laughs> all, all this stuff about inclusiveness and, and, and whatever that actually is not inclusive because they reject us. So it isn't really inclusive because they're not including us. But we don't need to be included at this point in time because we've got a saviour that includes us every hour of every hour. And he says, every bit of authority has been given to me. This is the saviour we worship. This is the saviour that we have given our lives to serve. And he's got all authority in heaven and in earth. Governments, you know, it, it, it's a statement out of the Old Testament that, you know, kings come and kings go. But God, he remains. And they can get their brilliant new telescope and they, look as, they can look as far as they want to into the last, into the past and, and, and say that they can't see God and he's looking down on them and saying, well, I can see you, you know, <laughs> hallelujah. You know, the Bible says that God laughs at the, at the indiscretions of men. He laughs at their feeble effort. So I want you to get hold of these scriptures. There's hundreds of them in the book, but these ones are just incredibly important. That we've got a God who was with us always. We've got a God who, 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 who walks with us. He, you know, he's, he's there all the time with us. He, he doesn't leave us or forsake us and... Even if you're in a state of, of unbelief or a, a state where you're not quite sure what he's doing and saying and you're not really confident that God is doing what you want him to do or where he should be at and, and, and your heart is not in the right place, God's saying, I'm there. I haven't left. I'm always there. Come with me to Hebrews 4. So number one, we've got a Jesus to whom we should bring our problems. Number two, we've got a God who's with us always and he isn't some artificial being that, that we've just laid hold of because we don't have anything else. He's the God who has absolute authority. He's the God who reigns over everything. 
He is in control. He's in control. Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. I believe. Hold on to it. It doesn't matter how much water is in the boat. It doesn't matter how quickly it is leaking. It doesn't matter what your situation is. And please, I'm not being uncaring here, but I'm saying we've got to get our gaze off the problem and onto the king. And we've got to say, Lord, what is it that I am not connecting of you that hasn't caused this situation to change? If it's something that I'm walking through, Lord, help me out here. As I said last week, one of two of the really most brilliant sermons I've heard in a long time are from Bill Johnson, just in the passing of his wife. And he said, we have a choice. We have a choice. We either get negative and blame God, or we throw ourselves at his feet and get his mercy. And they are both opposites. You know, in our situation, we can be so over... And we were all working through that. Someone said the other day, I heard someone saying the other day that... We often, we often in church, we seem to spend a lot of time talking about problems and about situations and it feels incredibly negative. But it, it, it can only be negative if we don't include Jesus. One thing we've got to be is we, we've got to have reality, folks. If stuff is going down in your world, you need to keep saying that. You need to be aware of that. If you're struggling with something, there's nothing wrong with you admitting that as long it's like a, it's like a good a, a good a good Irish stew or something, as long as you add the right ingredients, it'll come out good. And it's like that with Jesus. If you add the right ingredient, which is him, it's going to come out all right. We, we don't have the answer to everything, you know. I think they're one of the things that, that we're all admitting in this life in which we live. We, we do not have the answer to everything. But we do have one who is the answer. And I, look, this is not escapism, church. This is in my heart today. This is not escapism. This isn't turning your eyes away from your problems, but it's running to Jesus. And it's making his relationship the most important thing in our world. I'm so disappointed that people stay away from the house when they've got a problem, when this is the place you should be if you've got a problem. Because here we can solve it. Here the body of Christ can work. Why does Paul dedicate so many chapters of his epistles to the body of Christ? Why does he talk about gifts like Prabhu talked about last Sunday? Why does he talk about all of this stuff if we weren't meant to function as a family with power? And as a people with hope, and as those who've got something bigger than the situation, we have Jesus. We actually have the King. Hebrews 4, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold fast to our confession. For we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, hallelujah, because of this, let's come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find mercy and grace to help in our time of need. You have a great high priest. The Bible says that he ever lives to make intercession for you and I. There is somebody in heaven who knows your name. There's somebody in heaven whose scars declare forgiveness, who, whose bloodshed declares redemption, and he's got your name, and he declares it before the Father, and he knows your situation, and he knows your problems, and he is praying. We have prayer meetings regularly in this place. We're having worship tonight and intercession and just thanking God for his goodness, and, and, and we do all of that. We have a... You know, requests sent out by, by text and we, we do all of those things. But we need to remember that above all of that, there is a high priest who has the power of heaven behind all that he is. 
And, and, and he's just interceding for you every day of every day. He's crying out for you. He wants to see you succeed. He wants to see you walk in faith. He wants to see you lay hold of all the promises that have your name on them. He wants you to walk in the fullness of who he is. And he prays for that today. He's given us so much. You know, we've, we've got, as Paul says, we've got the gift of tongues that we can pray in the spirit. And even though we don't know what we're praying, he says that the Holy Spirit comes and takes what we are praying and he presents it before the throne and he takes it to God. And he declares it, you know. It's the power of what Jesus has done. It's that authority. It's that kingdom. You know, pennies often get a bad name because of some of the extremes that we get ourselves involved in. But he gave us a gift to use with authority. And he, our high priest takes it. Last text. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 1. Last book of the Bible, first chapter. John's on Patmos. They sent John to Patmos because they couldn't kill him. <laughs> Lovely. Here's the aged apostle, the one whom Jesus loved. And he's on this rugged island. I don't know what was there, but he's there because they couldn't get rid of him. So they sent him into exile. You can't squash the children of God. Did you know that? You can lock them up. You can destroy what they believe. And in some cases, you can take their lives. But you can't kill their witness. The biggest mistake that so many countries have made is that they thought if they persecuted the church hard enough, she'd die. But she actually grew stronger. Hallelujah. Because God was with them. God was with them. And I think the church in Australia needs to see some of those lessons that God is with us and he is our strength and he is our peace. It isn't that we become arrogant. It isn't that we become know-alls and anything like that. It's that we walk in the power. We walk in the authority. We walk in the blessing that he has given us and we live like that and we declare that. And those two words, we have got to have them written in our hearts. We have got to have them on our minds. It, yeah, you can talk about your problem. You can talk about your situation. You can talk about how hard it is. And we can compare how difficult things are. And I have no problem with that. But at the end, we have to say, I believe. I believe. Because, folks, I, I just want to tell you that it's the only alternative. It's the only alternative to turning our situations around. And even if your situation doesn't turn around, your relationship with Jesus will so improve that you'll, say to, that you'll be able to say, I just believe. I am, I am so excited about this. I just believe God. I just believe he's the one who can do all this stuff. And he's going to bring me through. Please don't discount making decisions. Don't discount making, you know, promises and plans. Don't, don't forget that and go and live in a cave somewhere. That's not the answer. The answer is to live in the things of God. But make the decisions that are going to bring Christ into it. Make the decision that means that you believe God. You absolutely believe God. Here we are, verse 12. Then John says, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. <laughs> if anybody could have recognized Jesus, it had to be John. And he said, I saw him. And he was clothed with a garment down to the feet. He was girded about the chest with a golden band. 
His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a, in a furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. This is Jesus, the risen one. This is the Christ we worship. This is the one that we're going to celebrate in a few moments, communion together, who paid a price. But he's no longer the Christ on the cross. You know, I, I, I'm not against, you know, church architecture that has Jesus on a cross. I'm not against pictures and, and artifacts that have Jesus on a cross. I'm not against that. But that isn't who he is today. Today he's the Prince of Glory. Today he's this shining one that John saw. The sorrows and the sufferings that he went through are past. He's purchased our redemption. He's made a way for us. There's a place prepared, as John 14 says, for you and I to partake of. There's a thing that God has done for us. He has never forgotten you. He's never forsaken you. But he's not the lowly Jesus. He's not the Christ of the, of the manger. He's not the Christ of the cross. He's not the Christ of the tomb. He's the Christ of glory. And I want to see some of what the old church fathers that I remember saw. I want to see the glory of this one. I, I, I want to personally be consumed by his glory so that I can walk as a reflection of who he is. You know, there will come a day when we will take off these garments and put on robes of pure white. There's a day coming when time will no longer have its hint or its hold on us where circumstances and difficulties and natural tiredness and aches and pains will no longer be part of our curriculum. <laughs> it's actually going to be fascinating. We, we, we may run out of conversation in heaven because we can't talk about the weather and we can't talk about our pain. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're made new. Glory to God. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Oh, hallelujah. Our conversation will be about Jesus. Our conversation will be at somebody you bumped in next door that you weren't sure was going to make it, but they're there, hallelujah. And the glory of God was... I, I just... I, I think somebody has written a book. I can't remember the author, but he wrote a book to say that when we talk about salvation, we need to consistently remind ourselves that Jesus is the risen one. Paul devotes chapter after chapter to it for whatever reason, for the reason that we needed to get hold of it, that he is no longer in a tomb. There is no memorial to Christ in Jerusalem. There's nothing that you can go to a, t a, a, a place where he was supposed to have been laid. You can go to where he walked and where he did stuff, but there is no plaque. There is no hole in the ground. There is no coffin entombed. He's not there. He is risen. Hallelujah. And this is who he is. He's not just walking around in, 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 in Jewish clothes. He's not just walking around as the son of man. He's walking around as the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. He's walking around with glory and the whole place where he is. Oh, God. It's just filled with glory. And I don't know what it is, but I, I think that we have conditioned ourselves not to think of eternity as much as we should because we've been told that we're escapism or something and, you know, you're just wanting to get out of the place. I, I don't want to get out of the place. I want to stay here as long as I can. I've got grandchildren I want to see go on with Jesus. I've got a brother I want to see come to Christ. I don't want to go. I want to be here and see all this stuff that God is going to do. 
I want to be here when the great Australian revival crashes on our shores. I want to be here when we see people coming to Christ like we saw them in Brownsville, for those of us who had the privilege of going there. I want to see hundreds running to altars all over this town, all over this land, finding Jesus as their saviour. In despite of what governments are saying and what legislation is doing, I want to be around to see that. I want to see my Jesus glorified. Because the book says that the reason he came was to bring many sons to glory. I want to be part of that. I want to see the work that he did on the cross come to fruition. And I want to tell you, I, like you, I, I, I don't find it easy to believe In all of the situations we face, I, I, I don't find it always easy to believe. I, I'm sorry, but I don't spring out of bed on Monday morning shouting hallelujah. What does somebody say? I usually say, oh God, it's morning, you know. Because <sighs> that's what it feels like. But I, like you, have to learn to make those two words my favorite words, I believe. And you know the rest of the verse says, that when this father saw what Jesus would do, he said, Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. And you know what? He wasn't discounted. Jesus didn't say, oh, well, we'll do this next week, come back. He answered the man's prayer because he didn't look at what he was struggling with. He looked at where he was at. I, I, I just want to tell you that this morning. When you're praying for something, Jesus is not looking at how hard you're struggling. He's looking at why you're doing it and where your belief is placed. He's looking, you know... <laughs> God wants honest prayers. If you're not feeling great, tell the Lord. If you're struggling with your pain, tell the Lord. If the answer hasn't come, tell the Lord. He's not against you declaring that you're not quite at the place where you can see the answer yet. He's, he's there to help you over the line. He's praying for you. He's crying. I, I thank God for people who pray for one another. I thank God that I saw people lay hands on Roy and Brenda this morning. That's what the body of Christ is about. We're about taking the problem and bringing it to Jesus. We're entrusting the situation to the king. Yes, if there's medical help, we're willing to take that. If there's medical solutions, we're willing to go there. But the ultimate thing to do is to take it to Jesus. If it's not working, please, can I say to you and say to myself, take it to Jesus. Because he's the only one who can answer the thing the way it should be answered. I'm like you. I'm, I'm on medication. I take my tablets. I don't do dumb things. There are days I think I just would like to shove a lot of them down the sink. But then I'd have to scramble to rescue them. Hallelujah. But you know, God's, God's a God of blessing. He's the God of triumph. And he wants to bring us into that this morning. And, and the reason I read that verse, because it really struck me, was that there was, there was a moment within the man's heart when he really wasn't sure whether he was believing that this son who had been like that always... From the day he was born, he'd had this problem. And the father had had to live with it every day of his life, not knowing whether this was the last day he'd have that child. And he lived with that. And it stayed with him. And then Jesus comes along and says, I've got an answer for you, my friend. If you can believe, all things are possible. If you can squeeze some belief out of your fear, if you can squeeze some belief out of your difficulties, if you and I can squeeze some understanding out of where we're at 
God says all things are possible. And that's where I want to be. You know? We're a place of hope. We believe God's going to do stuff. We believe in he's going to change things. Because he's a change-making God. We sang it. We sang it with heart. We sang it with enthusiasm. You're the miracle-working God. And that one line that, you know, really gets to me is, even when I can't see it, I know you are. Because Jesus said, I work and my Father's working. We're both still working. Hallelujah. There's no pension in heaven, glory to God. There's no retirement plan in heaven. They're still working right now. Right now, despite the time zones, despite what other are things that we're dealing with, Jesus and the Father are at work. And the Holy Spirit has been dispatched to move amongst the world, to move amongst Christians who believe and to hear their cries and to take their cries and take them to the Father. There is a, there is a vial that's full. The Bible tells us in Revelation there is a vial that is full with the prayers of the saints and there's going to come a day when it's going to be poured out and God is going to answer every prayer you've ever prayed, I tell you, because he's a prayer answering God. He hasn't given up and he won't give up. And all that he asks of you and I it's, it's not great faith, it's not bold faith, it's not unusual faith, it's not faith that demands that you get out of the boat and walk on water, it's not faith that you look at your empty pantry and declare it to be full, it's not that kind of thing. It's just saying, I believe God. And building, my final word on this is build a bigger picture of God than your building of your circumstance. And I've got circumstances and you've got circumstances that are big. But we have to build a bigger picture of him. Despite what we're living through, despite where we're at, we have to build a bigger picture of him and who he is and what he can do. And, and, and he hasn't failed. We, we, we tend, I don't know, we, we tend to think that the Gospels, you know, they've been written and therefore all that stuff is over with you know but that's not true God wants to keep writing those gospels in our hearts he wants to keep writing those miracles if he could feed 5,000 then he can feed you and I if he could raise the dead then he can raise your life into newness of health if he could heal lepers if he could give blind eyes in one in one case he gave eyes to a guy who didn't have any he's that kind of God you know, he can make the lame to walk. He can make the blind to see. He can unstop the deaf ears. He's that kind of God. And we have just got to bring ourselves. We've got to drag ourselves, if necessarily, to the place where we say, God, I believe. Where we actually have to leave our intellect behind. We have to leave our experience behind. Intellect makes you think that these things can't happen. Experience makes you think, well, it's never happened before. But I've got news for you. God has never been confined to what hasn't been done. He never has and he never will. He's never been stopped by what has not been done. He's still the God who can do the impossible. And across our world, if you tune into enough, you know, God's stuff on YouTube or whatever, you'll find that across our world, he's still healing the sick. He's still fixing broken bones. He's still taking metal out of people's, bo out of people's lives. He's still healing eyes and ears. He's still doing all of that stuff because he's still God. And the power, you, you know, without getting into end time theology the Holy Spirit is still here and while he is still here the power of God is present to do I believe I believe in the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit I believe in the uniqueness of Jesus Christ I believe he's still the King of Glory the fact that he's gone to heaven does not limit his ministry. It expands it. 
the fact that he gave it to a group of people who struggled to do what they needed to do originally, but then it all exploded when the Spirit of the Lord came. And folks, if I can encourage you in one simple thing, it's keep inviting the Holy Spirit to do his work in your life. You can never have too much of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. We invite you to come to communion with us this morning. Are we distributing? Or Yes, we are. We're distributing it. So, Father, we just thank you that on the night, as Paul writes, that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. Isn't that so Jesus? It's just so Jesus. In fact, without getting distracted, if you read the, the stories in the Gospels, even to Judas, he handed the bread. Knowing what he was about to do, divine opportunity to change, divine opportunity to alter the plan, that's Jesus. And I, I want you to get a picture of him this morning of him handing you the bread and handing you the cup and saying, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. That everything you've ever done that was wrong is cleansed by this blood. Every need that you have is provided for by this sacrifice. It isn't just... I heard I, I get this I, I heard recently that Louis Giglio, the, the guy that does all those wonderful DVDs, flew deliberately to Reading to get Bill's wife to pray for him. Because he believed in the book that she had written about the power of the blood and communion. There was something that needed to be released into the US. And he asked her while she was able to lay hands on him. He spent 20 minutes in Reading, just asked her to pray for him. Because he believes that the last time revival will be a revival of the blood of Jesus and the communion that we share. Because there's power in this. Jesus said, for as often as you do this, you remember me. And we remember Jesus and we remember his power Remember his authority, that nothing fazed him. Sinking boats, raging storms, yelling mobs. Even a dead child. Nothing fazes him. And so you can take your situation and I can take mine. As we take communion this morning, would you just remember this power? In this act, this isn't a church in isolation. This isn't a church hiding from the enemy. This is a church declaring the authority of the blood and broken body of Jesus that releases the power of the Spirit. So take in your own time and then we will have some announcements and dismiss. I believe God. I believe in the face of every difficulty. I believe God. I believe in every negative situation, God is bigger. I believe in every unknown circumstance, God has an answer. God has an answer. And that's where we've got to stand, folks. He has the answer. And our trust has got to be in him. And I come back to the original statement. Don't allow yourself to halt between two opinions. If God is God, then let us serve him. The alternative is much worse. He's God. There's no one like him. And he's sovereign in all that he does. And we entrust ourselves to him this morning because he is God.
So take in your own time and release some faith in the elements because Jesus has touched them and Jesus has given himself for them. Release some faith in them. Just declare, I believe. I believe, Lord, as I take this bread. I believe, Lord, it's your broken body, broken for me. I believe as I drink this cup, Lord, I'm partaking in the shed blood of Jesus, shed for me, shed for my health, shed for my sins, shed for my provision. That's why Jesus told us we should do it as often as we can, because it reminds us of him. It reminds us of him. Thank you, Lord. You're so good. You're so good. Precious Jesus. Why don't we stand when you're finished and we'll pray a benediction over you and and Mimi's going to come and give us some announcements. So as soon as you're finished, let's just stand together. Father, as we stay for some fellowship or if we have to leave, we just ask your covering grace to be over all that we are. Father, help us to lay our burdens at the feet of Jesus and to see what he can do with it. Lord, send us out of this place this morning stronger believers than we were when we came in. Help us to declare, regardless of the circumstances, that we believe you. And that, in fact, every circumstance has to come under the lordship of you. And we declare it over that circumstance right now. We grab hold of whatever scripture is relevant and we declare it over the circumstance, believing that God will change stuff. We grab hold of every truth that has ever been released to the body of Christ. And we declare that over the situation. And we say it has to change because God isn't going to change. You're the unchanging God. You don't conform. And we're glad about that. So send us out with your blessing, we ask, in the sovereign name of Jesus. Amen. Good to fellowship together this morning, wasn't it? And just before um, Cole came to speak this morning, I just heard this quiet phrase come into my spirit, long-term situations are coming to an end. And I thought, wow, God, thank you. Just what I needed personally to hear this week. So I just think that, you know, for anyone that that is, just get hold of that. I never like that word, grab hold of, but I I think that we need to get hold of that and just ask the Lord, Father, I'm just believing that for my situation, the long-term situation that we've been struggling with is coming to an end. Our God is good and we just need to declare his faithfulness in the house and just thank him for his goodness. And just declare that over your situation right now. And when Cole began to speak, I thought I should have shared that before. And, uh, but sometimes we're a little bit, um, I don't know, we just wait when we hear something. And so God just wants us to keep sharing, keep saying what he's saying so that we encourage one another. So just believe that for your situation today, that long-term situation is coming to an end. Wherever you have a struggle, in whatever area, whatever area, God will do it. So God is good and we just believe him for that. And God is going to make a way in those situations. And, you know, some of us had a very tough week and we need to repent of that unbelief or ever we've had that struggle. I think felt that's what God was saying to us during that message today. 
We need to repent of that and put things right before the Lord and uh, declare his goodness in our situation. He's faithful to us and we just need to keep trusting him in things we can't see. Someone shared that Gideon word with me and I said, I don't want to hear that word. <laughs> but, but God is good. We just need to keep hold of that. So coffee time at the back there. The men's team have provided a good morning tea there. And um, I just believe that we need to gather around Roy and Brenda. They're having a particularly tough time at the moment uh, with Roy's health. And we need to gather around and pray for him and believe for him that God is going to heal him, totally heal him and set him free of the diagnosis of this week. So we're going to do that right now in the end and just as we gather around there. So if you all are men and uh, the women too, just gather around, just gather around Roy there and believe and then I'll give the announcements when that's when that's come to an end. <laughs> 